Hi everyone, this is Seamus McGovern from ODSC. Welcome to the end of day four, our final keynote and actually our final session of the conference. We will begin shortly while we uh, just wait for a few more people to attend. I keep that, see that number keeps ticking up. Uh, a few quick words. So I do hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy during this difficult time. And I would like to thank you, our attendees, for joining us virtually. And of course, a huge thank you to all our speakers for providing such incredibly insightful talks and trainings under these, um, what of course are difficult circumstances. Since this is the uh, last day of our virtual conference, please do share your best moments at ODSC on social media. You can use hashtag ODSC, hashtag ODSC virtual, and make those mentions on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever your social media platform is, and we do have a lot of prizes to give away today. There will be a speaker Q&A at the end of the session, so please have your questions ready. And you can submit those questions on the question mark icon on the right side of your webinar panel. And my colleague Tushar from ODSC will be facilitating that Q&A session. So I see we have a lot of attendees here and counting, so let's get started. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Margaret Mitchell. Margaret is a senior research scientist in Google's Research and Machine Intelligence Group, working on artificial intelligence. Margaret, welcome and thank you once again for joining us and please do proceed. Great, um, thank you for having me. And um, can everyone see my screen if I do this? Hopefully the answer is yes. Um, it's nice having a quiet audience, I suppose. So I'll have no interruptions. Um, Okay, so as long as everything is looking good, um, I'll be talking about vi bias in artificial intelligence um, and focusing on vision and language in particular, uh, but this is something that affects a lot of different AI technologies, um, and hopefully some of the thoughts and learnings here can apply to um, technology that everyone's working on. Okay, so um, ordinarily there is people I can communicate with in the audience. So we don't have that today. So I'll just speak for you guys. So normally um, I might present this and say something like, what do you see? And people in the audience, such as yourselves, might say bananas or maybe stickers. Um, if you take a look, think about it a little, lo a little bit longer. What do you see? You might say, I see dull bananas or bananas at a store, um, start to get more creative. You might uh, say something like bananas on shelves or bunches of bananas, um, bananas with stickers on them. You can start doing sort of embedded clauses and get more and more uh, detailed in the kind of things that you're pointing out. Um, but looking at something like this and speaking about it, um, you don't tend to say yellow bananas, right? You see something like this, you might say green bananas or unripe bananas. You see something like this, you might say ripe bananas or bananas with spots on them. Um, or if you're me, you might say bananas that are good for banana bread. Um, but when you see something like this, you don't tend to say yellow bananas. And one of the reasons for this is that yellow is prototypical for bananas. So what does that mean? So, when we look at the world, when we analyze the world, we tend to make a lot of generalizations and use a lot of heuristics. Um, and one thing we do is that we sort of categorize things in order to reduce all the different differences that can exist in the world. And we apply basic labels and understandings to these categories. When we think of something like banana, it tends to be yellow. It's within our prototype of banana. And so it tends to be less likely to be said because it's something that's stored within that category. Um, and here's a riddle that I think really uh, sheds light on this. So a man and his son are in a terrible accident and are rushed to the hospital in critical care. The doctor looks at the boy and exclaims, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. How can this be? Well, as some of you may have guessed, um, the doctor is the mother otherwise known as a female doctor. Um, and that might be compared with something that's closer to a stored prototype that people tend to have, which is doctor being male. So when we see doctor, 
uh, we tend to think that is probably someone who's male, um, where when we see female doctor, we understand that it's outside of some stored prototype. Um, and when this study was originally done, this was a while ago, so I think some of the gender norms around who was a doctor and who wasn't were a bit more skewed at the time. Um, but they found that the majority of test subjects overlooked the possibility that the doctor could be a she. And that included men, women in, women in self-described feminists. Um, the point is that it didn't really matter who the person was. This wasn't an intentional thing that we're doing. It's something about our cognitive ways of uh, understanding the world, processing the world, and talking about the world. Um, and so this starts to come into play when we're when we're talking about artificial intelligence and what an artificially intelligent system can learn about the world. Um, so this was work done in, in 2013, a while ago, but I think it's quite useful to highlight um, how this works. So um, Gordon and Vendermi, looking at a bunch of different newswire corpora, noticed that the frequency of different kinds of words were not predictive of how common those words are. So a word like um, murdered, might be almost uh, you know, <laughs> several orders higher, uh, of magnitude higher than something like blinked. Obviously, it's not the case that murdering happens a lot more than blinking, but blinking is something that goes without saying. Um, it's less likely to be mentioned because it's just part of our everyday understanding of the world. This is called human reporting bias. And that's the frequency with which people write about actions, outcomes, properties, are not a reflection of real world frequencies or the degree to which they're characteristic, um, but actually something about the cognitive processes that we're undergoing when we talk about the world. Okay, so when we talk about machine learning and AI systems, we like to think about it as this relatively clean pipeline where first we have training data and they're collected and annotated. From there, a model can be trained. From there, the model creates some outputs. So it might uh, filter, rank media, aggregate, generate, these kinds of things. Um, and then people see the output. But even from the start, before we even collect the data, the data itself is rife with different kinds of human biases. Human data doesn't exist without bias. So when we talk about the world, when we take pictures of the world, we're inserting our own cognitive ways of understanding and processing things, and this affects the data that we produce. So uh, some human biases in data include reporting bias, which I just talked about, selection bias, um, stereotyping we're all familiar with, um, things like prejudice, implicit associations. These are all at play even before we begin to collect any data. Um, and then once we start collecting and annotating data, like we do when we're starting to train machine learning systems, um, all, all further kinds of biases are introduced. So things like sampling errors, um, blind spots, confirmation bias, um, and I'll talk a little bit about these uh, next. Um, so what you end up with uh, is something like a biased data representation. So it's possible that you think you have you know, fully well situated, appropriate amounts of different data for different groups. Um, but even then, you can end up in situations where different uh, aspects of those groups are, are recorded based on how the data was sampled, how the data was selected, um, and who ended up annotating the data. Unless you have a full uniform distribution over all locations and all possible annotators, um, giving you information about this data, it's necessarily going to be skewed in some way. Cool. So rather than having this nice clean pipeline where the training data is collected and annotated and you get to some sort of output eventually, you have human bias inserted at the very start of this uh, and then it propagates throughout uh, as the system is trained and then people see the output. And then as people see that output and then begin acting on it, that data then serves as further data for another collection system, a, a later training. Um, and so you have these food feedback loops where uh, bias in, bias out, and then bias further perpetuates throughout the system. Um, and I like to call this the bias network effect or bias laundering. Okay. So this basically captures a summary of what that is. 
uh, there's this overall network effect. So even when you start with as clear data as you could possibly have, you end up with an overall network effect where bias comes in at the start and is propagated throughout the system. And I thought The Guardian put this really well, um, this was a few years ago now, where they said, although neural networks might be said to write their own programs, they do so towards goals set by humans, using data collected for human purposes. And so if the data is skewed, which it will be, um, the computers will amplify injustice. And I really honed, up, honed in on this idea of amplifying injustice. Um, and there's some specific cases where I think it's most important to be aware of this. Um, and then I'll back off a little bit more to the vision and language nuances here. Um, so this is a task that I think a lot of people um, first became aware of algorithmic bias with. It's the task of predictive policing. So the task of predictive policing it's concerned with identifying likely targets for police intervention in order to prevent crime. And the idea is that systems are using the past crimes to make statistical predictions. Um, so there's several different methods that are currently in use in different law enforcement agencies um, across the US. A lot has been written about their effectiveness. Um, the idea is that it allows police to more proactively work with limited resources um, so they can be in places where crime is likely to occur before it occurs, before it occurs. Um, and ideally, this will help curb, viol curb violence while also um, working with a smaller number of um, people who need to be deployed to different locations. Um, but there's a few issues here. Um, one is selection bias, which is that this is actually based on data where a crime has already been reported. So ostensibly, this is a system that's telling you where crime is likely to occur, but what, but what it's trained on is places where crime has already been reported, not where it has occurred. And so this is already based on where um, police officers have decided to go in order to find crimes. And so it's already focusing in areas where police may already be biased to go. Um, for example, um, low-income neighborhoods, income, uh, neighborhoods that have a lot more people who are black, these kinds of areas are areas where um, there can be additional confirmation bias in play. You go there, you see a crime, and thus you think that this is where the crimes are. And then this creates feedback loops as that data from all of these uh, crimes and arrests are then fed back into the system. So it becomes more and more specified on these hotspots where um, there might be crimes, but it's not based on where crimes tend to occur. It's based on where people tend to go when they're cops and trying to um, uh, find crimes. So now turning a little bit to how something like this plays out in computer vision, um, we see these same kinds of biases. So, one of the starkest examples I saw of this was a few years ago. Um, there's a company that has started to uh, purport to predict criminality. Um, and the idea is that it can take in images of people and reveal their personality based um, only on their facial image. And this is stuff like criminal, white collar offender, terrorist, as well as high IQ and pedophile. Um, and there are lots of clients uh, in governments throughout the world who are using this kind of technology. Um, the problem with this is that it misses all of these different kinds of biases at play. So um, we don't have information on how that system is trained, but we do have information on a related system that was published um, called Automated Inference on Criminality Using Face Images. And this is rife with the same kinds of biases that were mentioned earlier. So selection bias in the kind of images that were selected, um, as well as sampling bias, um, and actually choosing different kinds of images based on the different organizations who uh, thought that different uh, cr criminals were likely. Um, and there was also confirmation bias at play, where basic hypotheses were not um, rigorously tested, and instead, like exciting results or pseudo exciting results were put forward in place of perhaps more reasonable explanations. So one of my favorites here 
was this idea of the angle theta from nose tip to two mouth corners is on average 19.6% smaller for criminals than for non-criminals. Um, but just doing a test on this myself, um, that also appears to be the difference between smiling and not smiling. Um, and so these sort of ideas that the, the system that you have in place is finding these very cool things that you want, you want it to find um, can often be so filled with the biases at play that you miss some of the more obvious factors that are actually contributing to the classification decisions. All right. Um, another area where this has come out in computer vision, um, uh, and this one was peer reviewed, so um, a lot more problematic because it got through various peer review. But the idea here is that you can predict homosexuality by looking at pictures of faces. This had the same kind of selection bias and sampling bias. So uh, in the study, they gathered images from dating websites. Um, and if you've ever compared what you might look like, on a dating website to what you might look like in a photo with your kids, you can also already start to understand how these might be sort of different presentational differences. Um, so this is a sampling bias in collecting this or selection bias uh, when they're all taken together. Um, and they said that, uh, that things like consistent with the prenatal hormone theory of sexual orientation, gay men and women tended to have gender atypical facial morphology. Um, and this is a similar kind of result that isn't actually supported by the data, but sounds really exciting if you can kind of see a relationship. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the things that we found was that, oops, one of the things that we found when we looked at it was that a lot of the characteristics that seemed to uh, be appearing in the images of gay versus straight people were actually quite explainable by just basic visual presentational techniques. So not by prenatal uh, hormones. Um, actually, those weren't tested at all in the study. Um, so a simple decision tree, just based on whether someone was wearing makeup, wearing glasses, um, got us close to the accuracy reported in the paper. This says a lot more about how people present themselves rather than what is happening internally. So the key thing here is that although it seems like the deep learning system or the AI system is doing something really amazing, it's actually just picking up on the biases of the experimenters, the skews in the way the data is represented, and reflecting them back to the world through a, through a lens of some cool sort of AI technology that's doing something more magical. So this is showing data bias um, in several ways, selection bias, sampling bias, uh, confirmation bias, and feedback loops. Um, so what now? Do we stop working on AI? Uh, obviously, that's not happening um, and won't happen anytime soon. But there is a lot that we can do to help mitigate these kinds of effects. Um, and one of the key things is in evaluation. Um, and that's evaluating on data that can illustrate uh, algorithmic bias. Um, one of the really, really important ideas here is what's called disaggregated evaluation. And this um, was really highlighted in this really great paper um, by Joy Bulamwini and my uh, colleague Tanika Brew, where they showed that looking at something uh, like gender classification, um, the accuracy of the different systems that they looked at had really huge differences depending on whether it was like a darker female or a lighter male. And this is the kind of thing that's totally uh, missed if you look at general evaluation techniques. But by doing disaggregation, you can start to hone in on different kinds of errors that the system is likely to make and account for those biases specifically before you release the system. Um, and so how this works is you create for each subgroup prediction pair, um, some set of true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives, and then you compare across subgroups. Um, and I'll break this down a little more. Um, so for example, say you're looking at women and face detection or men and face detection. In this case, uh, the women versus men is the subgroups, and the prediction here would be something like face detection. Um, it's even better if you can do this intersectionally, um, this idea borrows from uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a critical race theory scholar. Um, but the idea is that, I mean, very high level idea, 
uh, is that looking at multiple interacting subgroups at once um, can show you insights about your system um, that otherwise would be missed. Um, so for example, looking at black women and white men as they did in the gender shade study. And then you can break this down in terms of the confusion matrix. I'm gonna guess that most people at the conference are familiar with the confusion matrix, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but the, the basic idea here is that uh, if something is there and the model predicts it's there, that's a true positive. If something isn't there and the model doesn't predict it's there, it's a true negative. Um, and then there's a mix and match of the different kind of errors here. So if something is there and the model doesn't predict it, that's a false negative. If something isn't there and the model predicts it is there, that's a false positive. Now, the cool thing about this is now this gets us at the exact definitions for bias and fairness mathematically. So if we're looking for something like whether or not a female pronoun should be included, um, we can break it down into true positives. A female pronoun is included and the system predicts it. Uh, true negatives, a female pronoun isn't there and the system doesn't predict it. And then the mix and match errors I mentioned before. Um, looking at just the true positives and the false positives, we have the precision scores, comparing them across different kinds of pronouns, for example, female and male. We have comparisons of the precision across the different groups. Um, similarly, with true positives and false negatives, uh, we get the recall scores. And the really cool thing here is that looking at the recall scores across different subgroups gets us, gets us exactly to the quality of opportunity fairness criterion. So by doing basic disaggregated evaluation with respect to the kinds of errors our system is likely to make, we can start to uh, rigorously, algorithmically, mathematically measure the fairness of a system as defined by specific metrics relevant to uh, classification systems. Um, similarly, similar uh, or equal precision across subgroups is equal to the predictive parity fairness criterion. And the kinds of errors that you're going to want to prioritize, the kinds of um, performance that you're going to want to make sure to do well on is going to depend on the system. Um, so you choose these metrics in light of acceptable trade-offs between false positives and false negatives. So an example where false positives might be better than false negatives is when you're dealing with privacy and images. So a false positive is something that um, doesn't need to be blurred, gets blurred. So that's like, maybe it's a picture of a friend that you want to have in your images um, and it gets blurred. That's just kind of a bummer, but it's not a big deal. Um, but a false negative here would be something that needs to be blurred, is not blurred. And so that could lead to something like identity theft um, in the case of looking at um, private data. Um, an example of false negatives might be better than false positives is it in something like uh, spam filtering, where a false negative can be like email that spam isn't caught. So you see it in your inbox. Um, that's usually just a bit annoying. You know, you see some advert or you see some exciting email for winning a million dollars if only you click here or something like that hopefully you don't do that you're fine um, but a false positive is when an email is flagged as spam and then it's removed from your inbox so this can be like a job offer or a letter from a friend you haven't talked to in a while and here um, the false positive is a much worse situation to be in and so the kinds of evaluation metrics you then choose are based on these kinds of trade-offs in the context of the system um, another approach here, which seems pretty basic, but is also really important to do once we realize that data, all data from humans is going to be biased and skewed in some way, in multiple ways, um, is to put in constraints where the data is too biased to provide the general worldview relevant to that application. Um, and one of the areas that we've done this in at Google is in Google Translate. So um, because of, um, because of the way people talk about the world and because of actual probabilities um, in the world, a uh, doctor is more likely to come up with a he pronoun than a she pronoun. Um, and so this is really an issue when it comes to uh, languages that don't have gendered pronouns where it'll automatically fill in whatever is most likely 
And that can be a kind of uh, representational or allocative harm to someone who actually doesn't fit that gender. Um, and so in this case, this is where the sort of normative constraints start to come in. We know our data is biased and skewed in this way. We know our system is going to amplify that or replicate it. And so what we do is, is we insert the constraint that then reflects back the worldview um, that is intended for the application. So here we made the decision to actually break it down uh, by the different gender pronouns, regardless of what a top translation might say. Um, so all data can lead to uh, unjust outcomes. Um, this is based on the lack of insight into the sources of biases in the data, um, both in the data before it's collected and in the collection and annotation. A lack of insight into the feedback loops that are created as we put out data and then that data is acted on and then that data further informs new systems. Um, a lack of careful disaggregated analysis and so that's like breaking things down in terms of false positives and false negatives and looking at the errors across different groups. Um, and then human biases in interpreting and accepting results. So this is things like the confirmation bias um, and the different examples I talked about where uh, criminality and homosexuality was taken to be correctly predicted due to cool mathematical things as opposed to more obvious solutions more closely relevant to what the model was actually keying on. Um, so one of the messages here is just to handle your data with care, understand your data, skews, correlations, all of these things should be very rigorously analyzed. Um, select data from sources that are most closely resembling the data the system will be applied to. Um, so it's, you know, if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to create a predictive system uh, for gender in, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say gender, if you're trying to create a predictive system that's meant to work in the US, um, then training it on data from India is going to give you a different kind of output than what you might get um, from data that is from the US. Um, it's helpful to use held out data for hard, uh, hard use cases. Um, and then disaggregate the evaluation, like I talked about earlier. Um, we have some tools to do this from Google. So one um, useful tool is um, this code called um, FACETS. And this will help you break down the data in similar ways to um, how I discussed with different kinds of intersections and things like that. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done in really uncovering uh, techniques and tools here. Um, another useful, uh, a useful idea that is not yet a standard, but we'd like to work towards it becoming a standard, is just documentation around data. So this is actually talking about what the distributions are um, across different subgroups that are represented, what the different kinds of correlations are, as well as information about how it was collected. All of this will highlight the specific kinds of biases and skews that can be packed into the data and then help inform what that data is best used for and what kind of constraints need to be put in place in order to get to the, uh, get to the output that is best suited for the context in which a model trained on that data will be used. Um, and by doing these things, we can move from data that is ruled by majority representation uh, to more diverse representation throughout our AI systems um, for a more ethical AI. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Margaret, for insights into this most important domain of bias in AI that, that I know affects all of us here as data scientists and enthusiasts. Uh, attendees are more than welcome to ask questions by uh, clicking the question mark icon on the screen. Uh, I actually see one question already popping up here. So the question is, when we train our model on such biased data, it will tend to give biased results. How do we model systems which doesn't give biased results? Right, yeah, so part of the message here is that all data is biased. Um, and I say this specifically with respect to human data. I might be able to make some case for non-human data, non-human data not being human biased. But all human data is human biased. And so the idea of having a model that's not biased at all in any way um, is not an idea that can actually um, be born forth in real life. It's sort of an ideal that, we'll never, that we're never going to get to. Um, 
Um, and so what we need to do is think more rigorously about what we are representing, what we are um, biasing the model towards, and make sure that those things that are most relevant to how the system will be used in practice is well captured, um, has a diverse representation and or constraints that directly handle the kinds of bias results that we anticipate. Um, so yeah, there's this whole hope, I think, in the sort of AI bias ethics sphere that we can have unbiased models or clear, clean models, something like this. Um, one of the points here is, is that's not actually something that can ever exist. Um, but what can exist is models that we train by using clever sampling of data, by thinking deeply about how that data is produced, making sure that the different um, factors at play in that data are well representing the outcomes that we want to the system to be able to do well on. Um, and then adding human, you know, boring algorithmic constraints that we just write out when the model is uh, likely to produce really problematic biases and skews. Great. So the next question is by Kyle. Uh, is there an effort to create representative data sets that are publicly available, especially around text and images? Yeah, there's a bunch of different um, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, projects around this. One that came from Google is called Inclusive Images. Um, so the idea here was that when we have a label like marriage. Um, Vision, vision language data sets will tend to represent marriage in a very like Eurocentric or Western centric way um, and miss what, you know, what grooms and uh, brides look like in tons of other cultures. And so uh, the inclusive images uh, challenge and corresponding data set um, spent some time collecting data to handle this sort of thing. Um, that said, it's really hard to have really uh, robust representation of all different kinds of uh, states of being in the world in some sort of data set. Um, there's another really cool data set, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, darn it, that's too bad. Mm -mm. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. Um, there are some there are some data sets done that's done like with consent of different individuals around the world where they uh, provide their images and they can sense like here's my favorite item here's my favorite chair to sit in these kinds of things um, and it's sampled around the world so at least you get somewhat of a diverse representation there um, but these are generally very small scale because they are individually contributed by specific people um, there's ImageNet which is one of the main image data sets that computer vision models are pre-trained with and the people behind ImageNet are trying to do a lot more work to remove some of the problematic skews that are already there. Um, and so this is something sort of in the general realm of understanding right now. Um, but we're still not going to get to a, a perfect data set. Um, but uh, yeah, just short answer to your question. ImageNet is working on it. Inclusive Images is another example. Um, Kaggle, I know, is continuing to put out uh, more diverse data sets. So those are some places to look. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about Talia. Uh, is there a specific process to parse out data that cause algorithmic bias? Or are there standards to determine the level of bias? Yeah, so the standards, so the second question I'm really excited by because I'm involved with, I'm involved with some of those efforts. Um, determining a level of bias is not a thing that has been done yet, but governments all over the world are starting to pay attention to this. So there's a lot of discussion. Um, there's like ISO standards, IEEE is involved. I'm trying to figure out what it means to have a fair data set with respect to some kinds of categories. Um, so there aren't standards yet, but this is something that people um, throughout the world are really starting to work on and define. And I imagine within a couple of years, we'll start to see some clear standards um, of how biased or how fair a data set can be. Um, regarding specific processes to parse out data, um, there, again, there's not like standards here, but one of the methods that I found the most useful in my work um, is taking a look at what are the categories of, um, of individuals who are most likely to be disproportionately harmed. 
and then parceling out the data in light of those categories as, as best as possible for the system. Um, this gets up, oh, this is going to be a longer talk. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> just focus on, uh, on those bits of data that most closely correspond to how you think the system might uh, disproportionately create errors, um, and that will lead you towards uh, which areas of the data to focus on. Okay, we're running out of time, but uh, I'll go with two last two questions. So this question is, uh, I attended one of the sessions which uh, artificial data was inserted, generated by understanding organic data, along with organic data in case when data is small. So how should we apply the bias analysis in that cases and be able to train the model? Right, so data that's generated based on other data does perpetuate a lot of the same kinds of biases and issues within the original data set. This is an active area of research, I guess that make, you know that because you saw a talk on it. Um, but one of the big questions there is, are you creating data that a model can learn more from um, given that it's based off of some seed data set? Um, and I don't know that there's been really clear evidence showing that you can do that. So although you can augment data, um, you can generate synthetic data, it's not clear that that data is providing more than the original data, um, just that there's more of it. And one of the issues with having more of something um, is that unless you do it well, you can create situations um, uh, of overfitting, where you have too much of something spurious represented in the data set, and then your model picks up um, a totally other skew, a totally other bias that it shouldn't have learned from the original data set. Um, so I guess the short answer to that, or the summary of that, is um, the techniques for uh, data sets that aren't synthetically generated also apply to the synthetically generated uh, and even more so because there's a higher likelihood of amplifying uh, issues in the original data set. Awesome. So the last question uh, is which industries are setting the example for creating model bias, for correcting model bias, pardon me, and what are they doing to address it? Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't think I understood that. So which industries are setting the example for correcting the model bias oh, and what okay. are they doing to address it? Right, okay, so which industries? So industries that use models, um, I mean, obviously tech uh, is very active in this. Um, I'm, I work at Google, I work on this at Google. Uh, I have collaborators at Microsoft uh, who are also working on this kind of thing. Um, so it's definitely very active in, in the tech sphere. Um, outside of the tech sphere, I'm less sure. So I do give talks to like entrepreneurs um, trying to use technology in some other um, domain. And in those, I'm still teaching about what bias is. And so I think there's a bit of a lag at this point between uh, creators of the basic models and the basic technology and then people leveraging and using those models for other kinds of um, outputs. Um, currently, most of the work that I'm aware of um, that has to do with sort of correcting for model bias is taking place in the technology companies and then moving out a couple steps to different kinds of businesses. They're still sort of leaning on us and looking at us to instruct how to do that. Um, and so, you know, hopefully there will be more uh, industries who take up uh, these kinds of challenges, especially because um, they're deploying models in situations that are specific to their business, um, which might not be exactly how the model was originally developed at the technology company. Um, but currently, I'm, I'm mostly just seeing the work uh, within, within tech companies. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all for joining us here at ODSC Virtual Conference. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, streaming this keynote, uh, this closing keynote. Huge thanks to all our 250 plus speakers for the whole course of the conference. Uh, we hope you're taking good care of yourself and staying at home. Uh, please don't forget to fill the small survey after this session. You can also access the recording of this keynote uh, at the live.odsc.com platform. So please be sure to tune in uh, tomorrow morning for this. Thank you again.
Thanks.